<sighs> okay, so uh, the, the message went out this morning. Hopefully a bunch of you got it. Uh, 10.30 a.m. solutions. Well, here we are, 10.47. But we're going to have some. We're going to have some solutions. Uh, th and as I was, I, I was thinking, I was looking for the most recent Time magazine because I was sure that um, I was going to find a whole list of problems that we could talk about. Because usually, I could have just taken the newspaper, I guess. Uh, you know, it's really easy as we look out into the world to see a bunch of problems. Really easy. And we're encouraged to do so. Uh, we can think sometimes that it's other people are encouraging us to see problems. But really, well, they may be. But we really are encouraging ourselves to see these problems. But that doesn't mean that we don't see them. I mean, they really are, they're, they're, they're there in our experience. Uh, so we see a bunch of different uh, things going on, but, but man, if we got problems. Holy moly, we've got personal problems, we've got community problems, we've got country problems, we've got world problems, we've got a bunch of different problems. Uh, and it's easy to focus on them. But what I'm gonna suggest today is that all these problems are as distractions. They are, they are things that we have invented, not just uh, by ourselves, but, but with each other. We conspire to continue to invent problems to keep us distracted from the truth. And, uh, and so they, they keep coming. And, it's, and we, we can get, be a crusader and think we're going to go out and change the world. But the, the, the real issue is, and we can, we can actually make a change in the way we see the world. Uh, but, but we need to remember the way we've designed the world is that it will keep giving us problems. The, the, the material world is, what, is really what I'm talking about here. Uh, so, so we got a problem here, a problem there, every day a problem. I, I could probably make a rhyme out of that somehow, but uh, so, so, we, so we got money problems. We got work problems. We got people problems. We, I mean, just everywhere we look and, uh, and all of these problems the meditation that we just did was uh, concerning grievances. And what we need to understand is that every one of these problems that we identify is a grievance that we are holding against a person, uh, a, an institution, uh, a group of people, that th they are all just grievances. And, uh, and I'm not, uh, this morning, I'm not going to debate whether uh, they're well, I'm just going to say, they are not real in the ultimate sense of spirit. They are not real. But in our experience, in the material world that we are living in, they present themselves as being very real. But in that larger reality, they aren't. So what's really going on, and it says uh, in, in A Course in Miracles a little bit later on down the road, it says that every situation and everything that happens is a gift from God. Now, it's easy to get confused about this because then we start thinking that, that God is making bad things happen. But the fact of the matter is, God is not acting in, in the material world at all. God is acting in the world of spirit. But in the material world, there, these situations that occur, this idea that every one of them is a gift from God, it means that in that bad situation, there's an opportunity for good if we just turn our attention to the good, right? It's not that we look at a murder or, or uh, some horrendous crime or some terrible thing that's happening and say that that thing is good. That thing is not good. Actually, what we're saying is that in spirit, that thing isn't even real. It, it's real in the material world. But it's not good, but in the midst of it, in the midst of it, and in that next moment, which now, of course, if it's occurred, we're now in the next moment. We're not in the moment it occurred anymore that in that moment, that there's an opportunity for good. And that's where we need to put our focus. So instead of, and these bad things that happen, it can be as simple as, I just dropped a jar of sauce from the counter in the kitchen onto my foot. God, I hate when that happens, right? <laughs> that's a problem. But I'm not, I don't want to just continue to, and, and this, I have had this happen to me so many times when those quick things happen that cause a little bit of physical pain, maybe got quite a bit of physical pain. When I don't focus on it, the pain fades away. 
But if I focus on it, I can keep that pain for quite some time, for some, you know, some stretch of moments, right? So, so th that's just a, a, an example of some, just some minor thing that occurs. But if we could look for an opportunity for good that comes out of it, what did it do? First of all, it sure brought our attention back into the present moment. Like, we're, boom, I mean, wherever our mind was wandering, all of a sudden, bam, we're right there, right? So here's an opportunity to stay in that moment. Not in the moment of the thing falling on our foot, but the moment in each one that occurs after. So, so okay, so but if I focus on the problem, if I focus on the problem, the problem remains and it manifests itself into more and more problems, or it just kind of spins off. Have you ever been sitting there and, and you just think, and all of a sudden this crazy thought comes into your mind and you go, where did that thought come from? Where, how did I get, how did I get from there where I was a minute ago to this place right here? And if you stop for a second, you can actually go back in your mind and you can, you can remember which thought led to which thought. And so it gives you a picture of this process that is occurring in the mind. That because we are so undisciplined in our minds, they're just, our minds are just running wild. And, but we can see how one thing led to another. And this is how focusing on problems just leads to another thought about problems. And so today I wanted to talk about solution. So we got all of these. Let me not get ahead of myself. The idea that everything that happens is a gift is a hard idea. That it is not the thing itself that was the gift. It is how, what we do with it that then becomes a gift. So I just read from Hafiz, and the name of the poem is actually So Many Gifts. And he says, there are so many gifts still unopened from your birthday. There are so many handcrafted presents that have been sent to you by God. The beloved does not mind repeating everything I have is also yours. Please forgive Hafiz and the friend God if we break into sweet laughter when your heart complains of being thirsty. When ages ago, every cell in your soul capsized forever into this infinite golden sea. Indeed, a lover's pain is like holding one's breath too long in the middle of a vital performance. <coughs> in the middle of one of creation's favorite songs. Indeed, a lover's pain is this sleeping, this sleeping when God just rolled over and gave you a big good morning kiss. Indeed, a lover's pain is this sleeping, this sleeping when God rolled over and gave you a big good morning kiss. There are so many gifts, so many gifts, my dear, still unopened from your birthday. Problems, problems, they look like problems. There's really only one problem. How can I put this to you? I don't want to be unkind. There's really only one problem. Uh, the Course of Miracles identifies it as separation. Uh, specifically, separation from God. The idea that we're separated from God. Uh, some of us here identify it in another way. We call it self-centeredness. Uh, we call it total self-centeredness. Uh, it, it, the self-centeredness has been described by, by many people as they, well, most people just think about it when, you, when I say self-centeredness, most people just think selfish, selfish, just wanting what we want, right? But this self-centeredness that we're talking about here, that's the, that's the main problem, that's the only problem. <laughs> that self-centeredness is, is, is deeper and more, this self-centeredness is a sense of isolation. It's a sense of, that sense of being alone, in the midst of a crowd. I don't know how many times I've said these phrases. Being unloved in the bosom of a loving family. It's a feeling, it's a sense. 
It's like being in many days, being in a dark pit of despair and cannot see the light. So the self-centeredness that is the problem is this isolation. Uh, and sometimes we don't, sometimes we actually are kind of running around feeling like we're part of everything that's going on, but in those lonely moments, in those moments when we see the grievances of others, when we see the, the, the issues that people are not acting the way we think they ought to act, in our homes and in the world, that's loneliness. That's us separated and at odds with those around us. That's really the Catholic definition of hell for many years. They tried, to, they tried to redefine it, but the definition was separation from God. That's hell. That's hell. Uh, but it's not real. It's not real in spirit. It's real in, it's real in our mind. It's real in the material world. But if God is everywhere present, then where could you go that He is not? How, if God be with you, who can stand against you. And when, when that, that, that comes from the psalm, right? When, if God be with you, who can stand against you? And people have, have read that for many years as this idea that God is your, like your strength in the fight, right? And so you're going to be able to beat the crap out of whoever is standing against you. And how many times do we do that? I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about in our minds. How many times do we see these pictures, these fantasies about some kind of revenge that we're going to get? And we don't even think about it re as revenge. We just, it, we just think about it as, oh, I should have said that. And I should have said, and the next time I'm going to this. And all of those thoughts. This is not what that psalm is talking about. It's not saying that God is going to give us the strength to overcome the person that's standing against us. It's saying that there's no one standing against us. Because God is with us. So why do we think that somebody's standing against us? Because we are focused on the problem. We are focused on the fact that we think we're alone. And in that aloneness, we are vulnerable. We are in danger. So separation, self-centeredness, this is the problem. Uh, we could also call it body identification. If I identify more strongly with the body than I identify with spirit, then I obviously, as we've talked about many times, the body is in danger. Do not doubt that. That's what's, The body is in danger because we have built a dangerous world for the body to live in. But the spirit is eternal and cannot be in danger. So if I know that, and I can, and, and listen, all of the evidence that's coming to us every day from the material world is saying, no, you're a body and you're in danger. But if I can just start in my mind just allow for the possibility that really I'm not a body. That really I'm spirit. Just allow for the possibility. And see, the subconscious mind doesn't know the difference between you just thinking even a fantasy. The subconscious mind takes it as, re as real. And it starts working with it. So if I can work with those ideas a little bit more. So, okay, so body identification, separation, self-centeredness is one problem. It's one problem, and it's separation from God. And therefore, if I feel like I'm separate from God, how can I not feel like I'm separate from you? How can I not feel like I'm separate from everybody around me? And not just all the people around me, but all of the circumstances, all of wherever I go. I feel like, well, this is what happened if we think about the event in the Garden of Eden, which we, 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 uh, uh, we, we call it uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, apple deal. Uh, this, what happened after that? What happened is, this is what God says. God says, consequence, not punishment, consequence of you deciding that there's good and evil. The consequence is that the ground will no longer give up its fruit to you. You will have to toil, you'll have to sweat, you'll have to work so hard, and it's going to frustrate you. In other words, the, when we went into the mindset of duality, what we set up was we are now in a conflict with the rest of the world. And so we are going to have to work hard to get everything to cooperate. In other words, we're going to have to fight. There's more to that message, but we'll talk about that another time. But so this is the situation that keeps getting presented to us is I'm a body, I'm alone, I'm in trouble, I'm in danger, things, bad things are going to happen to my body. And, uh, and then every day, you know, and especially as the older we get, every day we look in the mirror and we see, oh my God, it's true. The body is falling apart. Uh, but spirit is just like it was. Spirit is just like it always was. It is pure and loving 
And that's who we really are. So then, then so there's one problem, and there's one solution. The problem, we can identify it a number of different ways. We have already said self-centeredness, but what happens with self-centeredness is that's fear. This is how we then react to life, is with fear, because we're alone. Of course, how, how else could, I mean, we're alone. And so fear comes. And fear shows itself as anger. It shows itself as disappointment. It shows itself as alienation. It shows itself all sorts of different ways, but it's fear. It, show, it shows itself as conditional love. I'm, I, I want, uh, uh, I'm going to give you my approval and my affection as long as you do what I think you ought to do. And if you don't, I won't. It, it, uh, it shows itself as envy. And when I, when I see something good happen to you, that's a threat to me. And so I want what, that good that came to you and I don't want you to have it. Of course, consciously, we don't think about that because we, we don't think it actually that way. But that's what happens. We, we, uh, we, we, we uh, are presented with a situation and we say, oh, if only this would happen, then it would be okay. Well, all of these things, and there's like seven faces of fear, and that's another talk too, but th this, uh, uh, the, these, th these things occur and we react with these different faces of fear, and, and we continue to live and move in the material world instead of remembering the truth. And this, this Jesus said, we live and move and have our being in God, not in the material world. This is a good thing to remember. So all of these other things are happening. So the solution to this is, the, 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 the problem is fear. The solution is love. So this is what I'm saying. I mean, it can't be any simpler than this. The solution to every single problem that you think you have, the solution to every single problem I think I have, the solution to every single problem we think the world has, is love. That's it. That's it. I can go home now. You can go home now. Gave you the, that's it. So, oh, but it's difficult because we think about love as, we think about love in an emotional way. We think about it as, you know, a lot of times we get it confused with Rome. But, you know, the Greeks identified a number of different types of love. And all of those types occur to us when we think, when I say that love is the solution. We think about brotherly love. We can think about romantic love. We, you know, the, but, but. The love that I'm talking about that is the solution is the overarching love. The love that we have, that for, it, it is a, actually a love that, that when we are focused in the material world, we really can't get our minds around. And we can't even, we really can't quite comprehend what it is. But there's some, there, there are some signs. And this one sign is that we actually feel connected. And I'm going to say this morning that we can develop that sense of connection. We're going to start with that. There's two, two pieces to it that, that we can relate to in this world. The first is that we feel connected. So the way we feel connected is we actually can have a sense and we feel a bond, right, between us. So in order to, and the problem is that we can feel, I, I can feel a bond with anyone until they do something that I don't like, right? And then for a moment, the bond is like cut in my mind anyway. Because now they've done something, right? And so, they, so I don't feel as close to them. But here's a way that it usually works pretty well. If you can think about someone in your life who you really are not, someone who you really, really feel close to right now, just anyone in your life that you really feel close to, that, and you can almost feel yourself hugging them, and you can hold them close without any uncomfortability coming into it. And you could hold them close for a long time and it wouldn't feel weird, okay? So if you got a person like that, that you can picture right now, and probably everybody here does, then that feeling, whatever that feeling is, that's the feeling of connection. That's the feeling of a bond, right? Through meditation, you can take that feeling and apply it to anyone. I'm going to give you the real hard task here. Later today or tomorrow or whatever, think of that person who you saw in the meditation that you were mad at or that you were disappointed in, that you were upset with, and visualize yourself holding them close and having the same feeling that you had for the person that you know you love. You can do it. All, and remember, you don't have to actually go out and grab them off the street and start hugging them. 
You just have to do it in your mind. You just have to see it in your mind and feel it. Just, uh, just transfer the feelings. Uh, it, you, you can do it. A everybody can do it. So then that's the first piece. This is how we grow our sense of connection, which is ultimately going to lead to the, the amelioration of these problems that we see. So then the connection. Next, the second half of this is that we desire only good to come to them, no matter what they did. So this is the big, this is the challenge, right? This is the challenge. And so, um, so the way that I, and, I, and I've got a whole thing that I tell about this too, but the technique to, 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 see, to want only good for this person or, or all people, no matter what they've done, is again a visualization where a baby, this is what I always use, was my, my granddaughter. When my granddaughter was born, I have a story that I tell called Love the Baby. I actually told the story so much, I, w I spoke one time at a convention, there was a guy in the back of the room that put up a sign and said, Love the Baby. <laughs> So, but the idea is that you have a, you, you have a, a, a vision of a, a baby that you have or that you have held in the past that you, you feel like, you, when, you, when we think about babies, we have a tendency to think about them as this innocent, they, they, they need to be protected and all this kind of stuff. And that's a good picture for this, for this particular exercise. Even though they're a bunch of little hedonists, we, we, <laughs> But, but really, when we hold them, we feel that, that, that we treasure them, right? We cherish them. And so this is, this is another technique is that when we get conditional with other people, see them as a baby. They're just a big baby. And I know you can go with that in all kinds of different directions, but the idea is that's the truth. They are a